Good afternoon and uh, good morning for those joining from the East Coast of the United States. My name is Cindy Valladares and it is a pleasure for me to be here with you this afternoon to talk about 10 steps to achieve risk-based security management. With me we'll also have Daniel, Brand, uh, Daniel Blender from Tectonica co-presenting with, co with me and we'll have an opportunity to introduce him uh, to you in just a few minutes. Um, before we get started, just wanted to point out a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, you will receive a copy of the presentation, so you don't have to worry about ta taking copious notes because uh, we will be sharing this with you at the end of the presentation. There's also a white paper that goes along with this that we will um, send you and make it available to you in case you were looking for more information. And our attempt to, is to make this as interactive as possible, but for um, issues of time, we will take the questions at the end of the presentation. We will, however, be taking the questions uh, during the presentation, so please feel free to submit your questions. At, at the end, I'll do my best to answer all of the questions that we have on the time that we're allotted. So let me um, go ahead and start with um, just giving you a brief overview with uh, who we are and um, what, uh, what are we going to share with you today. So. The first step is let me introduce you to Daniel Blander. Daniel is um, is uh, the president of the security consulting firm Tectonica. They do work all over the U.S., Europe, Middle East, and South Asia. And he has a wide variety of industries that he covers, including banking, finance, healthcare, retail, airline hospitality, and others. I've uh, known Daniel for four or five years now, um, and he's uh, very well respected and very well known in the industry. He has many years of hands-on knowledge in technology and security and risk management, and he's a frequent lecturer uh, at B-Side San Francisco, InfoSec, um, even in Athens, as well as Pakistan, and multiple lectures for the European Network Information Security Agency, ISACA and ISSA. So we're very pleased to have Daniel on the call with us today. And um, what will the, the format of this change is, um, the format of the change is that he will be, uh, we will be taking, uh, you know, we will be walking through the steps. And Daniel will be sharing some uh, war stories, the success stories from the customers that he's been dealing with and working with. So, Daniel, are you on the phone that you're able to say hello to the audience? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon for you. Good. Great. Thank you. And I did introduce myself earlier. My name is Cindy Valladares. I'm the Product Marketing Manager here at Tripwire, and I'll be your host um, for this webcast. So why don't you say, uh, Daniel, we go into the meat of the program and uh, do some introductions at the beginning. Um, if you're not familiar with Tripwire, uh, we are headquartered in Portland, Oregon. We've been founded in 1997, and we serve customers in um, almost 100 countries, and we have award-winning patented technology that uh, we make it available for our customers. To find out more, you can go to tripwire.com. And um, let's talk about why we decided to do a, uh, a presentation on risk management. And what we're seeing is that the interest in risk management is spiking. And um, I would say it's been 12 or 8 months or so since I've been seeing that trend going up and increasing. And I think part of it is because non-technical executives um, are asking for, you know, how are we doing in security? And risk management provides that platform for discussion between technical and non-technical uh, personnel that allows for some budget and resource allocations. 
What we also see is that habitual security spending is not necessarily aligned with the business. And we did a survey earlier this year, a benchmark survey, among the state of risk management practice, and this was very, very prevalent in those discussions. And I'll talk about that later where you can get that report. Um, so what we see is that more objective me methods are needed to allocate those limited budgets. And um, the other driving factor is that compliance is driving conversations around risk. And I know probably a lot of you are saying, you know, why compliance? You know, that's uh, uh, something that we just have to do. But if you look at um, the goal of most compliance initiatives, it, most of them address risk management in their um, in their wording. Let's take, for example, the PCI DSS, uh, the latest version, and um, some of the special interest groups that the council has created around risk management. We have several requirements here that talk about how do we need to address um, risk management, risk rating, and risk priority. Uh, perhaps the biggest one is requiring requirement 12.12, what it calls for an annual process that needs to result in, a for, result in a formal risk assessment. If we look at um, outside of industry-specific requirements, we also look at government bodies um, uh, and methodologies like the IT Grundschutz in Germany, where we see, you know, that methodology calls the, the identification, you know, characterization, analysis, assessment, evaluation, um, treatment, uh, and all the way down to acceptance and communication of risks. And there are other non-government bodies, especially in Germany, that have taken IT Grundschutz as a basis for developing their own either organizational um, require, compliance requirement or security policy, if you will, or, um, or um, industry bodies that have taken that as a basis. Also, Basel II, uh, they talk about how to ensure that banks have adequate capital for the risks they're, they're exposed to, and it calls for very specific controls, whether they're change controls or configuration controls, but mainly IT controls to protect those investments and um, mitigate those risks. Probably the most well-known um, here in Europe is ISO 2705 and the series of ISO um, standards, uh, but 005 calls for, the, it, it is the information security risk management standard that a lot of us are using. And if you're in the banking and the FS space, the monetary authority of Singapore, although it's based, you know, in Asia, it does um, show its uh, requirements throughout the banking industry, whether that's in, a in Asia, in Europe, or in um, in the Americas as well, and that has the Internet Technology Banking for Risk Management. So if we see a lot of the requirements for banking, uh, for um, compliance requirements out there, call for a risk management practice. So how do we define uh, risk-based security management? Um, if we look at, uh, if we take a look at risk, risk is a combination of what's my likelihood of my probability of something to ha happening and the impact of that likelihood. How is that going to affect my assets? And it consists of, um, you know, threats, vulnerabilities, and impacts to the business. A lot of people have a very narrow view of what risk management is, and it's really focused on uh, only vulnerability. But what we're talking about here on risk-based security management is more comprehensive and more broad than that. Uh, but it is part of a larger ERM strategy, but it is specific to information security. Uh, and, and the goal is to enable the business. Um, Daniel, I know you have some thoughts about risk-based security management as well. Yeah, it's, it's very important. As you mentioned, it's really about identifying threats and identifying the probability of those threats occurring. Many, many times when I'm talking with companies or working with people doing risk assessments, 
you're often thinking about the possibility of something happening. And they end up coming up with very extreme ideas, placing uh, uh, backup tapes in a room immediately adjacent to a data center, not realizing that the whole purpose of having situations like that is to make sure that you have disaster recovery plans. They're thinking of one possible thing, but not what are the most probable things that could happen. So you have to be careful when you're doing your risk analysis to understand that you're really looking for a balance of what is the impact of something happening and what is the probability of it happening. Threats are really anything that can have a negative impact on the things that we can value, so we want to understand them so we know what the impact can be. We want to understand that vulnerabilities are situations that can be exploited by a threat, and we have to factor these together to find the possibility of that actually occurring. Um, also, in most really mature organizations, security, risk-based security management is a very potent part of a broader enterprise risk management program, meaning organizations that look at risk management across their operations, their financial practices, all their different areas, have a very mature view. And when I've been able to create that mature view or some of the best organizations that Cindy and I have talked to, when they have a very mature view about enterprise risk management, their security programs also are very risk management based. Okay, so um, you made some really good points there, Daniel. And um, I also want to talk about, you know, the framework of risk-based security management and how do we start in this process if we're not already there. But I think, you know, first step is decision needs to be based on the identification, analysis, and how do we prioritize risks. As you were saying, not every threat or every risk is created equal. Um, and not everything that we have in our organization needs to be treated the same way either. Um, so decisions can become more explicit if we take a risk-based management uh, approach because we have a process that we go through to um, examine and analyze those. And if risk analysis is the guide, then we can focus our efforts on other areas that produce greater benefits for our organizations. How, how have you seen this work as well in those organizations? Well, when companies understand where the priorities should be, what are the most probable situations or probable threats, they are able to focus their time and their money where they need it. I, I, oh, I can think of hundreds of examples where I've gone into organizations and they're obsessed with one program, one simple security tool or one simple set of measures such as a vulnerability management program. And I will go in and say, well, this is interesting, it's useful, but only for one portion of what the risks are in your environment. In one case, I went in and all they were focused on was that vulnerability management program. I asked them, what are you trying to prevent against? They couldn't identify that. I asked them, what are the priorities? What are the greatest threats you have? They couldn't identify that. They simply knew that a vulnerability management program was something that someone had taught them they needed to do. So what we did is we walked through and started asking about what were the most valuable things. We asked about what things could impact the business at the greatest level. And the result was we had a much better understanding. We actually walked through these 10 steps. Suddenly their whole program changed. They became more focused on things that valued or valued by the organization. And each of them turned out to have positive impacts on how the company operated. Systems became more available, surprisingly, because there were very close relationships between the risks and the availability of the systems. And they had a greater level of comfort where the things that were unknowns in their environment, attacks or viruses or things that they couldn't plan for, they could spend more time focusing on those because highly probable things, the things that they could control, got taken care of because they focused and put solutions around them. Things that were the outliers, the unusual things, 
they could spend the time to analyze because those were the only things that were left. Great. So let's let's just look at, you know, from now on, we're going to talk about the 10 steps to risk-based security management, and we're basically going to start with number one. Um, and, you know, the step number one, it's really identifying what matters to the organization. Whether there are intangible assets or tangible assets, every organization has different business goals and objectives that they're trying to achieve and different assets that they need to protect. And what I've seen sometimes is that within the organization, they may not have the same sense of what that is. So that's why it's really important to have a cross-functional team that talks about that. So how have you seen that successfully been done in organizations, Daniel? Well, first and foremost, as I kind of hinted at in the little example I gave previously, is I make sure that everybody in the security group understands the priorities of the organization, what the organization sees as their biggest assets, the most important things that they want to achieve. And very rarely do I ever think of assets being a specific system or a specific set of data. Instead, it's a much more macro process. And every CEO or CFO that I talk to, they absolutely get this because their focus is always on how much is the company making? How much is my newest initiative going forward? What risks do I have in this new program or new plan that we're trying to make sure goes in place? I want to make sure my risks are managed. So what I will do is I will take the team that I have, and I did this in one case. I, I had a security department that when I went in, I asked them, what do you know about the company? And only one person in the entire security team had any idea what the company did. In fact, one of the quotes I got was, well, what do I need to know about what the company does? I'm here for security. And they missed the whole point of that you're here to prevent the risks for the things the company's trying to do. So what we did is we went around and interviewed for two weeks every VP and director in the company about what their department did, how their priorities played within the priorities of the company, and what are the things that kept them up at night? What were the threats they worried about? We did this under the thin guise of what is called a business impact assessment. If you're familiar with business continuity planning or BS25999, you're familiar with this process. We used it to identify the threat, but also what were the assets and the interrelationship between all the processes of the business. Through this, we were able to create a very, very clear picture. In fact, we put this up in the wall in my office, a real simple flow diagram between all the different uh, groups within the company. We had with them the revenue of the company, the minimum, the maximum, the medium. It also included the key processes, what each of the groups were worried about, and where the revenue flowed. We were able to identify also what was the amount of time that a group could be out of function or not working, and what were the key sets of data that were associated with that. Nowhere in there did we list systems. We just looked at the organization. Because now what we could do is whenever someone came to us and said, hey, what's the threat around this computer system? We could directly look at that group that it supported and understand what that group, the macro process, what the impact was to the business. This is something that's important in any organization. You need to understand that first so you know what matters when you're doing your risk assessment. Yeah, and I think what you mentioned is how, how can you move to steps two and, um, and subsequent steps if you don't know how to, you know, if you haven't identified what, what your goal is and what your purpose is. So second step is, you know, collect the data on the things that you've defined in step one as being the most important ones for the organization. So how, how would organizations go about collecting that sort of data and becoming a project that doesn't turn into years and years and no, um, no light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> but collecting data can become such a process, but 
more importantly, you're trying to collect observable data. You're looking for things that will support your risk assessment. As we kind of mentioned earlier, risk is a collection of threats and how often that they happen. And it's a collection of vulnerabilities, which is weaknesses in your systems and the ability of your controls to resist uh, an attack or a, to resist the threat. So you want to collect anything that can help you understand those observable data, measurable data. And to do that, there are a lot of different sources. You can do the deep dot, which can be very useful. But you also want to be careful not to over dig and, and spend too much time trying to do this. If you're a small organization, spending weeks gathering data can really cut into your ability to do the work that the business needs you to do. So there are also quick sources of this data. Some of the things that I'll do and a lot of the companies will advise to is recommend they use things such as the data breach reports that are out there. They're a quick win. They're not perfect. They have bias to them, absolutely, but they're a starting point for measures. They'll give you an idea, at least in percentages, which areas are the most prevalent in the breaches that have occurred. Another tool that I'll recommend are things such as honeypots, which will help you identify how frequently do I see threats against certain services or certain types of activity in my environment. I can do that on a very simple basis and know what's going on both outside my network as well as inside. It will also help me understand what activity changes over time. So one month I might see a high amount of activity in one area and another area, or another month I might see it at a different rate. I've used internal existing systems. One of my favorite stories is around uh, data loss prevention or a DLP system. In showing the frequency that incidents actually were occurring inside the environment, it helped me understand what the threat was, and it also helped me then drive later decisions as we did that risk analysis. Now, some of the data is not going to be easy to gather. Some of it's going to resist quantifying. It's going to resist you going out there and saying, I see five, I see 100, I see 200, giving you hard numbers. And this can stymie those of you who really want perfection or exactness. Uh, let's be clear, risk analysis is not a game of precise, uh, precision. It's not a game of precise prediction. It's a practice of identifying probabilities and the impact when they occur. But as we say, probabilities. It's not absolute. The data that you're collecting is allowing you to make your analysis more accurate, which means you can narrow the range of things that can happen. I always use the analogy of if you're defending a fort, and that fort happens to be on the edge of a cliff. It's more likely that someone's going to attack you from the flat land, from the area of your fort that faces out onto a field, versus climbing up the cliff to get to your fort. Now, is it possible someone can climb that cliff? Absolutely. But what's the probability? Where should you focus your cannon? Should you focus it on the cliff? or should you focus on that flat field surrounding your fort? Data will help you narrow that field and understand where you should focus that cannon. Try not to measure the unmeasurable when you're collecting that data, but try to identify what is measurable. Um, for example, trying to measure the number of threat actors, the people who are threatening, or how many people out there can threaten you, and a precise number is very, very difficult. But imagine that instead you categorize them and call them sponsored or state-sponsored or what I'll unfortunately refer to as APT, as much as I dislike that term, but those highly sponsored. And then you have another category of unsponsored skilled attackers. And then you have semi-skilled attackers, people who have gone through some training, know how to use some of the public tools, say a Metasploit, then you have script kitties, people who just have a fun tool and can find dozens of them. And then the completely unskilled, those who have never been trained in how to break in through that, that vulnerability. What if you could categorize based on that? 
that would give you some measures about the skills of the threat actors that you can then use in a risk analysis. So don't always obsess that it has to be a hard number, although hard numbers are very, very useful. But when you're stymied by that, look for other ways that you can measure the, the values for those so that they're tangible and understandable. And there is, um, you were mentioning different kinds of threat um, actors. So there is a paper that we produced um, a few months ago with Brian Honan out of uh, Ireland um, that talks about layered security and how you should look at all of those different actors and look at their um, purpose and their attack vector so that you can defend against all of them. So you can look at that at tripwire.com. Let's move into the next steps to make sure that we have um, enough time to discuss all of them. But step number three, which perhaps is the most critical one after identifying what matters the most, is performing that risk management, um, that risk assessment. And that this is the one where I see a lot of people struggling with because it beca becomes really, um, you know, where do I start? You know, I need more guidance on how do I do that. And once you've done that risk assessment, you need a way to present it to the organization so that decision can, decisions can be taken upon the information that you found and the analysis is really objective and not biased to your point of view. So I know you have some really good examples, Daniel, of organizations that are, have done that risk assessment and have done that successfully in how they've managed to present it in a way that makes sense for the different stakeholders. Yeah, and there's a great example I'm going to give. Um, I want to caution everyone that this isn't the only method or model to use, but there are definitely some very clear criteria that you need to focus on when you're doing risk a risk analysis. So always make sure that you're working from observable data. Make sure that um, what you're doing is tangible and that you can relate it to things that are out in the wild. Focus on accuracy, not precision, and when you're doing your risk assessment. And have, make sure it focuses on identifying probability not the possibility. As we talked about earlier, you're really looking to eliminate or reduce highly probable events from your environment. And one of the items that I found most frustrating in a lot of the assessments that we did, um, several ISO 27001 assessments, we would go through and do our initial risk assessment, risk analysis in preparation for an ISO audit. And, or prepare the controls prior to the audit. And what most of the tools we had did is they gave the scale of high, medium, or low, or five, four, three, two, one. And it wasn't very meaningful. There wasn't any meaning behind it. What does that mean? What is that in dollar amounts? What is that in impact? What is that in frequency? And so what I did is I turned that on its ear. said, let's not try and do this by raw numbers because I don't see any meaning behind it. I said, give me some meaning behind those numbers. Make sure that if you were to take that same set of measures that you're going to call for your frequency and your impact, that if I then looked at a subset of one of those controls, maybe it is network access controls, if I looked at what is the risk of this kind of firewall versus another kind of firewall, that I can use the exact same scale, and it, it fits to a smaller analysis just as equally as it does to a larger analysis. Meaning I can say what is the relative impact of that firewall in relationship to the whole organization just as much as I can say what is the relationship of network access control in general to the rest of the organization. So what I did recently is an example, focused on vulnerabilities. Um, we had a client that where we were examining a vulnerability that we'd identified in the environment. And the vulnerability team was very worked up about this specific vulnerability. And we needed to understand the urgency of the impact of this specific vulnerability that they were very worked up about. 
versus our regular day-to-day remediation efforts. There's a lot of pressure to get things patched. There's a big movement up. We have little data on it except the measures that were provided by the vulnerability scanning vendor. So what we did is we said, what can we use to actually do a risk assessment around this? We focused on it because it had really become a point of contention with the engineers at odds with management for how to address it. So the first thing, what I do is I ask five questions. The first is what assets are related to the affected system? Right back to the step one, what are these critical assets? In this case, it was email. Well, I asked, what is the email used for? And they said, well, it's related to mergers and acquisition activity. The executives use it. Also, all the workers use it, so all the employees. Um, so there are quite a few activities, and it ranges from highly confidential and sensitive all the way down to common emails that we send around. This really helped us understand the value of that particular asset. What is it used for? What was the impact to the company? Then we said, what population of people would have access to directly exploit this vulnerability? This was actually asking about the threat actors, who we thought could exploit it. So when we did a quick examination of firewall, looked at a few logs, we poked around at a few things, we could see that the population or the people that could reach the system was limited to internal employees and the administrators in the organization. Let's be clear, we did consider that there could be external entities such as hackers or third parties who had already penetrated the network, but we knew that that would be a very, very, very small set of people, and the primary threat actors were going to be the internal users. So we knew what the population was for threat. We asked, what was the difficulty in exploiting this vulnerability? We had a couple ways we could do this, but most of them seemed kind of difficult to understand. We had the CVSS value for exploitability of the vulnerability. It gave us a measure. So if you've ever looked at CVSS, you know that it's on a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 scale. We used that as kind of a baseline. We said, all right, let's start somewhere. It's at least a reasonable guess, an expert opinion of how exploitable it is. But let's also look and see if this is part of any public tools that are out there. Let's see if it's out there as part of Metasploit. Going back to H.D. Moore's law, if you've ever heard of it. If you haven't, go do a search for it. It's a very interesting little theory of how to prioritize or understand the level of difficulty to vulnerabilities. But it wasn't in Metasploit. That was a good thing. We took a look at Mitra and looked at listing the vulnerabilities and found that it, at the time that we looked at this, you are really not immersed beyond a theoretical vulnerability. So we considered the level of difficulty to be quite, quite high. What is the frequency that this type of exploit occurred elsewhere? Where is it been seen in your organization? We looked in a myriad of different places, but given that there was, wasn't a publicly working exploit, we knew it was very unlikely we would find anything. Frequency was considered quite low if it occurred at all. And what controls do we have in place that would mitigate or increase the resistance against that vulnerability or against the threat actors? And we had tools such as firewalls blocking access to the system, controlling what traffic flowed around, which reduced in a rather significant way the ability to perform the exploit that was described. So what we did is we took all that data, merged it together, and said, a vulnerability has been identified it can be used to expose internal email communication. Value of this email, which is talking to the asset, is related to the value of keeping confidential any sensitive communication between company personnel, which could relate to competitive advantage, knowledge, and we kind of listed out some examples. There are no publicly known examples of this particular compromise occurring. The controls in place limit the threat to primarily internal personnel, and a high level of competency is required, which likely exceeds really everyone at the company. That was our risk analysis. The management looked at that and said, wow, so this is a pretty obscure vulnerability. While it could be a, have a high impact, it's not something that we'll likely see. Our answer was yes. 
And then we caveated it by saying, if hackers got into our environment, that could create that situation. I said, okay, so we understand it. It's a very high impact that occurred, but the probability is very low. They got a very clear picture at that point, the real risk, not something that was a 54321 red-green chartreuse. It was a real value associated with it. And I think it starts that discussion as well, Daniel, as to, you know, present it in a way in the context that that the stakeholders that are non-technical can understand what that means for the organization and how it aligns to the things that are important to them. Um, we have uh, – I would like to spend – perhaps no more than five more minutes um, addressing the steps and then move right into the Q&A because we have some really good questions queuing up. So why don't we talk about um, the following steps, five through eight, all in conjunction, you know. So, you know, identifying the control objectives, not necessarily the controls that we're going to use, but what are we trying to mitigate then, after we've identified what objectives we want to achieve, uh, selecting the types of controls that could best achieve those objectives and implementing and operating them. Because I think it's often the case that we jump into the specific controls because it may be mandated by a compliance requirements without necessarily taking a look at what are we trying to achieve. Do you have a good um, short story that you can share with us, Daniel? Absolutely. Um, this is one that I see frequently happen because a vendor comes in, says, I've got a solution for you without even knowing what the original problem was. And a favorite example of mine was several companies. It's not just one, but I've had at least three or four rush to implement PLP or data loss prevention or protection technology. And they put it in because they want to put some blocking functionality that stops what we all want to stop, which is inappropriately exfiltrated data or data that is being taken or sent outside of the company. Many of the justifications were based on a belief, not any hard data, but a belief there was a high likelihood of the data being exfiltrated. Um, but they didn't have anything to justify it. So what we did is we really asked the tough question and said, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do? We're trying to block data from going outside the organization. And I asked the question, what type of data, what type of situations, what are the threats? And they talked about attackers. And they said, we want to know if attackers are trying to send data out through covert channels. And some of you might be saying, well, to, to catch data exfiltration, shouldn't DLP work? Well, if you look carefully at the tools, and I asked a lot of the people on the teams when I've worked with them, what does this do? I already kind of knew, but I wanted to see if there were any new tools that they considered. And they were very limited. The LP focused, most of them, on just HTTP, FTP, email, and instant messaging. If any of you have ever done any penetration testing, you know that when you're looking to exfiltrate data, you don't use a common service. Most of my friends will start off sending data out through port 53 on DNS because it's never blocked. But none of these tools will check that. So we went back and looked at what was the control objective, and we said, is this tool going to satisfy that control objective of monitoring for exfiltration of data? And the reality was it wasn't. Now, ironically enough, when we put, when one of my clients had quit in place and we went in to go measure and see how much it was seeing, was it effective? We saw a total of seven incidents that were occurring per month of data exfiltration. Well, actually, it wasn't just data exfiltration. It was inbound, six of which they were external parties sending us their sensitive information. And on average, one per month of an internal employee sending their own personal sensitive information for business purposes. I'm sorry, for personal purposes, not for business person purposes. Risk was averted. Well, you can figure out what risk was averted. Not a heck of a lot for the business. Okay, so um, let's move into step nine in how do we monitor and measure our progress. 
think we are, um, and it's not necessarily only monitoring specific controls, um, but how are we progressing in our risk management efforts? What types of things should we measure and uh, what type of information should we share with uh, our management team as well? Well, the first step is really to monitor and measure your environment, much like the measures that happened back in step two, except now because you've identified the risk, you have a very clear picture or a much clearer picture of it, and you know what things you put in place in terms of controls and control objectives, you have a clear picture of what you can measure. So start to collect that data, but make sure you're collecting it and looking at it in relation to the original risks that you're trying to mitigate. So you want to focus on that. Um, I've collected data from things such as DLP systems, as I mentioned before, web application firewalls, firewalls, antivirus, logging systems, honeypots, all kinds of sources of data. In some cases, it's just raw network traffic, which seems like an awful lot of data. The reality is you're not going to go through and look at each individual packet and the deep dive into each individual packet. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be summarizing data. You're going to be looking for changes in the frequency of certain activity happening. And those changes should be related to the controls that you have in place. That's the kind of feedback that you want to give. If you can identify who are the threat actors and what they're doing and you put a control in place, you should be able to then see that measure that you were doing go down or be reduced. A honeypot that looks and sees how many times people from the outside world are hitting your DMZ or your public-facing Internet environment. The honeypot should see the numbers go down if you were to put in front of it certain filtering technologies like a simple firewall that number will go down. Or a web application firewall, if your honeypot focuses on web applications. And if you can say that the number of attacks have gone down because you're measuring it from that device, you can present that back to management. Or even use it yourself in feeding back to your original risk analysis. Because the key here is really to create that feedback loop. We all know security is not a linear go fix it and it's done. It's a loop. So you want to know, are there changes in the environment that can affect your previous risk assessment? Are there changes in the threat that's time changes? So you may put a control in place, and the threat finds a way around that. Can you identify? Does the nature of the threat actors change? Do the threats adapt to the controls? Is the control being operated as intended? Is it meeting those control objectives? that you originally laid out, which are really designed to address the risk itself. It's not just a tool that went in because it seems like it addresses it, but a clear and deep understanding of what you're trying to mitigate. If you're able to do those, you're going to be able to now go and adjust your perceptions, adjust your risk analysis, and adjust your approach. The data collected indicates the effectiveness of the controls in mitigating risk, and it's valuable. If it helps you affect your risk analysis, the control objectives, and the control design, it's even more valuable. Make sure you're operating that feedback loop, because that's really going to be the key to constantly improving your program. Yeah, and I think it also um, needs to be in context, as we were talking earlier, about um, in context to what the business does. Because um, if we if we keep on the technical control world and don't um, put that information that we obtain from the controls back into the business objectives and the contents, we lose traction with the same people that we're trying to change the perceptions from and report back to. So I think that covers um, the 10 steps. What I'll do is um, I'll open it up for questions because there are a couple of them. And if you haven't asked your questions, um, I will definitely um, recommend that you do so. But um, 
there there was a question earlier on that talks about, you know, could you point out to any good references that talk about threats and uh, vulnerabilities because there aren't a lot out there. And before I let you answer, Daniel, um, I, I don't know who asked the, questions, the question, but if you can shoot me an email or um, send me a, a note on Twitter, my email address is right, my Twitter handle is right here. Um, and I'll put my email address here shortly, C. Valladares at tripwire.com. I can make sure that I can send you a presentation that I recently saw by Martin McKee at um, an event in Portland, besides Portland, where he talks about all of the different resources that are available free for anyone in the industry, uh, from information sharing through um, to the Verizon DBIR report um, to other reports that people put out that can be easily shared at no cost. So, um, in fact, what I can do is just put my email address in the message box so that you see it. Um, Daniel, do you want to answer that question um, in terms of resources that are available to look at threats and vulnerabilities? Martin's uh, information is probably more thorough than what I could get out in the next couple of minutes, but I will tell you that some of the tools that I use very frequently are the Data Breach Incident Report. Um, I've used it for percentages and as a baseline for several customers that want to rely on it. I'll also wrap in any other source I can get my hands on. Um, most of them, by the time, you know, we've gotten into about the second month of our risk analysis plan are internal resources. We'll use the external resources as what I might call a prior. If you work with Bayesian, and you know what I'm referring to, but it's kind of a baseline point. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. It helps me refine uh, my perception. So the DBR is kind of my start point. I'll use trust waves on occasion. Uh, a little more difficult because it's not quite as classified, but still valuable information. So take a look at what Cindy has because Martin has some great sources, and I know Martin's adding quite a few new ones, hopefully, to that mix very soon. Okay, the next question is, um, can you elaborate uh, about the shift to cloud computing and the risk it causes for organizations? Hmm. I think that's a whole other talk, but let me put it simply um, in that I've got a client right now that I'm working with that is a SaaS provider, and I've worked with quite a few in the EU previously, and that is cloud computing isn't necessarily any riskier than your own internal. The risk really to me for cloud computing is understanding what risks are. If you don't understand risks in your own environment, understanding the risks in a cloud environment is going to be even more difficult because you have to ask the questions that you haven't even been able to ask yourself. Cloud computing is nothing more than you placing systems. If we want to really overly simplify it, it's nothing more than you placing systems in somebody else's environment. So the risks there are around what things you don't have control over. What are they putting controls around? Do you understand those controls and their resistance to threats? The threats don't change. The threats are exactly the same there or virtually the same there as they would be in your environment. What changes is their level of control. So if you can ask the right questions of your own environment and understand what things you need to understand for a risk assessment, you can understand the risk around cloud computing very easily. But if you can't go through these 10 steps for your own environment, you're going to really struggle trying to understand it for cloud computing. Again, there isn't a big difference between the two. It's purely the fact that and unknown to us, something outside of our little four walls of control. Once we understand that, it's much easier to frame an analysis of where the risks are for that environment. Yeah, and I think also having an understanding of what information you may want to put um, on the cloud and which one don't, because if some information is deemed very valuable for you, you the risks um, that you could um, have by putting it in the cloud may be not worth uh, 
um, the opportunities that you have or the cost savings. So you may decide that for certain types of information, it may be okay. For certain ones, it's not. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, which uh, I'll answer first, and then I'll, I'll let you respond as well, Daniel. But can you explain better how we can link SIM data to risk management frameworks? So um, this is this is one question that's very dear to my heart because um, work with with a product here, Tripwire, that delivers um, SIM functionality as well as log management capabilities. But um, what I see is that a lot of this information that SIM produces, it is. Um, I don't want to say worthless, but it loses the importance unless you're able to bring in the business context. So it is good if you are looking at network traffic and patterns on your network um, and you are responsible for deep packet inspection, but if you're truly understanding how to protect the systems, the data that you have, you have to be able to bring in that business context in the information that, that, that you have in your SIM. And um, this is another opportunity for you to shoot me an email, and I've already seen several of you asking for Martin's information, so I'll, I'll provide that to you in the next couple of days. Um, but definitely, I've been working with Gardner um, in a marketplace that they've defined an enterprise security intelligence in how can capabilities such as tripwires, system state intelligence that take some of that SIM data and business context feed into that enterprise system um, state um, enterprise security intelligence that is more of a risk management framework. So I'll be more than happy to send you that Gartner brief as well if you shoot me an email. Um, Daniel, do you want to take a crack at responding that question in terms of how do we link SIM data to risk management frameworks? Absolutely, absolutely. That's one of my favorite tools, uh, at least at a, at a more base level than the SIM analysis. So SIMs in the way that I perceive them, just to be explicit, is that there is a layer of abstraction where some of the SIM tools will start to do correlation of various events and tell you if there are alerts and things like that. And that's probably a little less useful for risk analysis. What I find highly useful is the raw data that comes out. And let me explain why. It's because I will often mine that data and I will go look and see how many times did I see some sort of attack against my web servers or some sort of activity against my web servers. What kind of activity was it? Was it uh, SQL injection attempts? Was it just plain old scanning of ports? Tell me what type of activity it was. And I can slice and dice that data in a million different ways. I'm a freak for data. I love doing this. I create these wild graphs and things. Not nearly as good as some of the really, really powerful data miners that are out there, but still, it's incredibly valuable data just pulling it out and saying, let me break it up into individual categories. What I'm able to do with that raw data now is start to measure and understand what sort of threats do I scalp? How frequently do those things occur? And I can see trends. That one of my clients, I had a very simple Excel spreadsheet. I had to pull the data from the logs of our log server. I had to separate it out. But I separated it out and created trends for things such as different types of web attacks or different types of data that we saw being exfiltrated or different types of scanning attempts on the firewalls. And I was able to lay those out and use that to feed the risk assessment just by having simple counts. So log data is extremely, extremely important as you get more sophisticated, you'll start to automate those processes. But again, I tend, I tend to lean towards the raw data, primarily because there are a lot of different ways that you want to look at it. Uh, the top layer of a SIM may abstract it a little too much, but the raw data you can twist and, and look at from many, many different angles. And that's really what can be helpful in risk management. 
Great. So I'm already seeing that we won't be able to answer all of your questions, so I'm going to try to move as quickly as we can and answer as many as we could. Um, just a reminder, you will get a copy of the slides as well as a recorded, uh, um, recorded um, webcast. So you can, if you missed the first section, you can for certain um, take a look at that at your own time in the follow-up email that will come up. Um, there, there is not a question but a recommendation here that um, Ray is suggesting, suggesting that uh, people read a guide published by NIST, uh, which is the NIST SP 800-30, Revision 1, Guide for Conducting Risk Assessments, and I'll put that in the comment section as well. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, uh, let's go to the next question. What about um, – how can you give some recommendations about how to scope uh, with the dynamics, dynamics of risks? Because that's as same as threats, they're ever-changing and ever-evolving. Well, we have to be careful about what term here we're using. Are we talking about threats or are we talking about risks? That, that taxonomy is very, very important to understand. So yeah, the question are... talks about dynamics of risks. It's a pretty broad question of my definitions. Um, you have to understand that most of my perception is based on the methodology of FAIR. Um, I use FAIR very frequently. So risks to me are the combination of impact and likelihood or probability. So the dynamics are based on what is the value or the impact of what can happen and the probability of that happening. Any of the data that feeds those two sides of the equation are very important to me. So understanding how threats change over time and what trends are are very important to start helping me understand probability. The impact tends to be fairly static, primarily because asset values don't change dramatically over time. So you don't see dramatic changes in, say, your revenue stream. You don't see dramatic changes in your customers or your intellectual property. Where you do see the dramatic changes are on the probability side of the equation. Who are the threat actors? Who have you considered as being the threat actors? Um, what is the frequency with which they act? And a lot of people will dismiss some of the more obscure actors and say, oh, well, people like Anonymous or the uh, uh, random threat actor it won't happen to us. Why would they want to come after us? They neglect to understand that there are probabilities there, too. They may be lower and less frequent, but they still exist. That's where most of the dynamic occurs. Your asset value and your impact doesn't change all that much, but where it does really change is over on the threat side, and that's where I see most of the dynamic. Okay, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Apologize if we didn't get to your question or we ran out of time, but do, we do appreciate your time. And uh, please reach out to both Daniel and I on, on Twitter. We are very active and would be glad to connect with you um, or send me an email, as of you already have, with the resources that you need. Thank you, Daniel, for being pre uh, the, my co-presenter today. And uh, thank you to the audience for sharing uh, an hour of your valuable time. Thank you.